Hello to my friends joining us via recording. We are going to start unit number two today with lesson number five. But before we dive into that, we took a moment here with some of our friends in class today to think about what helped us to prepare for exam number one and what wasn't super helpful for us in preparing for exam number one. So I want to start over here with some of the ideas that we said weren't super helpful. And then we'll share some of the things that we said were. I always ask my students this question every semester, whether we're online or in person, I always ask after exam one, what did you do that didn't help? And I kid you not, like 90% of my students say, these, say this right here, cramming. Or the word I'll get a lot is procrastinating. Waiting until the, the very end to, um, to, to do our studying, that's not gonna work. Um, especially when we start working on lessons um, in unit number three, where we really have to understand processes, how things work. Uh, cramming is, is never going to work for anatomy. So make sure we're spreading out our study time. I, I know I saw a note over here on most helpful things, building that study guide throughout the course of the weeks. Um, that definitely is a good approach. So please don't do cramming. Don't do procrastinating. That kind of stuff is, is going to make it really hard uh, for you to make sure you really understand the information. I like how someone put a note here that that they they did maybe didn't review some of the stuff they thought they understood. Um, definitely want to at least glance over it uh, as we are in the lead up to the test to make sure that um, we really do remember the important stuff. <clears throat> Several of us honed in on, on this practice test over here for things that were really helpful for us because one of the benefits of the practice test is it, it helps you to remember some of those, those things that maybe you didn't review before uh, because you thought you understood them. So definitely take advantage of that practice test. I will get one of those up for you for unit number two as well, just to give you a chance to, to keep working on and, and keep practicing that material. I also see that we have a note here too about um, spending hours specifically studying just the outlines. Um, as you probably figured out taking the test, uh, the outlines, I'm never going to ask you word for word the way that we talked about the information in the guided lesson or the way that we wrote it on the outlines. I don't want you just to memorize for our class. I want to make sure that you understand. So some of these things that we did over here that were helping us with understanding, like explaining our objectives to ourselves or to other people, uh, that's a great way to make sure you're not just staring at your notes outlines trying to memorize them or trying to figure out what that big picture is for each of the outlines. Uh, another great, great study idea. Uh, if, if you're not a fan of studying with other people, uh, that's where the, this explaining objectives to yourself. A lot of times I will literally tell my students, stand in front of a mirror and try to talk to yourself about the cl class material. I mean, you can talk to someone else if you're comfortable with that, but if you don't want to talk with someone else about it, talk to yourself, literally out loud, explain the objectives to yourself because that gets you to start hearing things and it gets you to start having to put into words um, these ideas that you're studying. We, we do our live sessions, right, so that you hear things, but also making sure that you can explain them as well um, it is another good thing. So I like that we talked about explaining them either to ourselves or studying with other people. And, and this practice test here, I would pair up this practice test with this idea here of working on quizzes without notes. Since you have unlimited attempts on the homework assignments, we definitely can do it several times with our notes to get as high a score as possible. But I would recommend before the closing date on that assignment, Take it a couple of times without notes, just to help you know what things you don't understand, especially that practice test as you're, you're getting ready to go take the real test. Um, that'll pull questions that we had on the homework to remind you, oh yeah, I didn't look over lesson number three, that, that second half of it or something. So um, quizzing yourself without the notes, explaining things in your own words. I also like too that someone said they studied in chunks. 100% uh, split this stuff up over time. I do have the, the calendar for you guys to try to keep us on track with working through things slowly. Um, so please don't 
always shove anatomy until Sunday night, right? I know it's tempting, but don't always shove anatomy to, to Sunday night. Try to work on it throughout the week and uh, use that to slowly be studying over time. Miriam has a question or a comment. Go for it. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but I remembered something that I've been doing and I forgot to share with my group. So mm -hmm. uh, speaking about quizzes uh, and assignments, um, I I'll, whenever I take the assignments or the quizzes, I always have a, a, a paper next to me and I will write down whatever questions that I missed and I go back to the notes, uh, read it over and try to take the test again if it's the same thing happened again that I couldn't understand, I will just write it down to ask a, a friend on the group or, uh, or even ask you, Dr. Alice. And that was really helpful. Awesome. Yeah, I, I like that idea, too. Keeping track of, of things that are, are giving you trouble. Because a lot of times it's easy to, to not pay attention. Um, being aware that, oh, I missed it on this assignment and I missed it on my next attempt on the assignment, and then I missed it again, to help you know where those problem areas are. So yeah, I agree with Christina, that, that's a, a really helpful approach to it as well. I know somebody um, is probably feeling a little angsty today, and I understand, it's totally fine. Um, they said that something that didn't help them was not knowing what was wrong. Um, so here's a, a couple of things I'll mention here. I am totally willing to work with you if there are particular questions that are giving you trouble. So if you're having a hard time figuring out what you got wrong on a particular question because you've done the assignment five times and you can't get it right, um, if, if there's something that's really confusing you, I'm 100% willing to work with you. I'm not going to give you the answer. I might refer you to a place in your notes. Um, but I am willing to work with you for, for my friends who are a little frustrated about not knowing exactly what's wrong. Part of that's the learning process. I want you to go through with your notes and try to figure out what's wrong. If, you're, if you really can't get there, and if your classmates can't help you get there, I am a resource you have to help you out. So I'll, I'll toss that out there that I, I am willing to, to help you with particular questions. So please don't be afraid to email me. Um, usually I'm going to need you to shoot me a screenshot, especially if you've taken the assignment 10 times. Uh, I'm not going to know what question you're talking about on which attempt. So if there's a particular question that is giving you a lot of trouble, let me know. I am, I am willing to help. And I, I know a couple of you mentioned this in your comments, um, but another really helpful resource that you guys have is that group me chat. So classmates that are studying the same stuff as you at the same time as you, um, definitely connect with that, that group me chat so that we, we if, if nothing else, we can all commiserate about how hard, how hard it is to study these things, right? So um, consider that, I'll, I'll add that to our list here of, of helpful things. The group me chat, consider joining that if, if you haven't joined that already. Okay, so someone's mentioning supplemental instruction, so that, that's something to consider as well. I don't know if we meant to put it under least helpful or most helpful. Uh, I know Elise uh, does answer questions. Hopefully she's a helpful resource. Uh, but if SI wasn't working for you, then um, take a pass on at this next unit. I know some of my students really love it, and some students would rather work by themselves. So that's totally fine. All right, so consider... The other question I would ask you if we were in person is to consider what you're going to change going forward. Um, so consider if there's some of these things over here that you didn't do as you're preparing for exam number one that you might want to try. It's all about making little adjustments throughout the semester. What can I do to do a little bit better on the next exam? Or what can I do um, or what can I not do that didn't help me on, on the first exam? So keep in mind going forward, fresh start. We get to do uh, we get to do unit number two now. So we can we can pick pick our, our destiny, right? What, what were those books called? Um, those ones where you get to decide what you're doing. I'm, I'm blanking this morning. Pick your story, maybe, or something. Um, we get to pick our story now. So decide if you're going to study in chunks or if you're going to make the mistakes to cram. Let's not cram, right? Let, let's pick our studying in chunks or, or watching those recordings or doing our quizzes. So choose your own destiny. That's, that's our motto for today. All right. Lesson number five. Let's dive right in. 
Lesson number five and lesson number six are both about proteins. Uh, so when we were talking about the cells, the salty banana, right? Um, we had a lot of proteins inside our cells. Proteins are made of big long chains of things called amino acids. So let me give you some words that, that you probably saw in our, our notes outline in our guided lesson. Uh, this word called a monomer, when I talk about a monomer, that, that word just means the smallest piece of something, the smallest piece. So when I talk about proteins, I would actually call proteins a polymer. Uh, poly means many. So a polymer means that I've put together a whole bunch of something. My, my monomer is, is the pieces. So when I talk about my, my polymer, my big picture thing that is proteins, the monomer of it, the small pieces of it are these things called amino acids. So amino acids have two parts to them, how they got their name. They have this area on the left that's called an amine group, where I've got a nitrogen and a couple of hydrogens, the amine group. And on the other side, over here on the right, I see what's called an, an acid group or a carboxylic acid group. So this, this oxygen up here and my, my oxygen and hydrogen over here. My amino acids have the amine group, amino acid for the acid part of their name. Now, I, I'd seen the cartoon before, I, I had to, to toss it in because, you know, we need a little bit of upbeat in our life right now, right? So you could also think about amino acids as an acid that's mean, right? It doesn't actually help you learn anything, but it's funny. So uh, amino acid, a mean acid that we use to, to build our proteins. Proteins are a polymer, which means they have lots of pieces we're gonna to put together these monomers to build the really big polymers. So notice how I've got a couple of amino acids over here that are by themselves. When I attach them to each other, I start to build my protein. So the process that I use to attach individual amino acids to each other to build a protein chain is called dehydration synthesis. Hey, not a trick question. Help me out in the chat. When I talk about dehydration, what happens when you're dehydrated? What goes on in dehydration? Yeah, we, we don't have enough water, we're, we're losing water. When I talk about it in the context here of building proteins, the dehydration part means I remove a molecule of water. Dehydration, remove a molecule of water. The, the synthesis part of its name means that I'm building something. Synthesis is always, is always gonna mean building. And dehydration tells me the way that, that I build these. So I build a protein using dehydration synthesis, meaning steal a molecule of water when I steal an OH from one acid group and I steal an H from an amine group on a different amino acid, when I pull the, the components of water off, I generate something called a peptide bond. And I want you to underline, highlight, star in your notes, peptide bond. That's a term we're just gonna have to know. Every single time you see peptide bond, you should be thinking proteins. The only kind of macromolecule that has peptide bonds is proteins. So when I pull off a molecule of water and I build a peptide bond, I'm building a protein. That's my goal, is, is to build a protein. And proteins are held together, the, the, the type of bond that holds together my amino acids in a protein is called a peptide bond. So this big process, one of your learning objectives asks you about dehydration synthesis. This process of dehydration synthesis, basically all we need to know, water comes off and I build a peptide bond. That's gonna hold together my amino acids. Now I can't remember if, if let's talk about this, but I'll just toss this out there for future reference. We can also do a process called hydrolysis. 
hydrolysis. This ending part right here, this lysis part, means we're breaking up a bond, in this case a peptide bond. Not a trick question, I promise. If it's called hydrolysis, what do you think I'm using to break that bond? What would hydro stand for? Yeah, it would stand for water. So what we can we would also see happening is you could also see this process going backwards. I can actually add water back. So have a peptide bond. I can actually use water to break it. So you may see see that term pop up hydrolysis. That's the way that I can break the bonds inside proteins, breaking them by adding water back to them, by adding a hydrogen to one and giving the, the hydroxyl group, is what it's called, OH, giving that to the other one to break the bonds. So when we talk about proteins, it, it really comes down to water. Are we taking away water to build a peptide bond? Are we adding water to break a peptide bond? Either way, anytime you hear this terminology peptide bond, it is always proteins, 100% of the time. And for that matter, anytime we, we talk about amino acids, what we're talking about building is a protein as well. So if we're making a little list for ourselves of, you might call them protein trigger words, we'll call them trigger words. Things like peptide bond, Things like amino acid, um, those are, are some of our trigger words, things that make us think, right, we're, we're talking about proteins here. Uh, so consider those uh, are words that always lead to proteins. One of the big things you need to know with proteins is that they have four different levels of structure. So four different ways I can describe how they're built. Um, they start from the most basic level all the way up to the most complex level. What we're looking at, at in our image here is the most basic level of protein organization. For any of my friends who had a chance to, to work lesson number five, What's the most basic level of, of protein organization called? What kind of structure are we looking at here? Yeah, so this is called, we call this the primary structure of a protein. Primary structure of a protein. When we talk about the primary structure of a protein, this is the order of the amino acids. So the, the way that I put them in a row, the, the, the order they go in that I, I use peptide bonds to attach them to each other, that's known as protein's primary structure. Now, primary structure of a protein, the order that I put my amino acids in, that comes from a cell's DNA. So the order that you're going to, to use to build your proteins is actually dictated by the sequence of your DNA. So we're going to talk about in lesson number six how we use our DNA to get this primary structure. So we're going to talk about processes called transcription and translation. That's what I use to get to a protein's primary structure, to the order that my amino acids go in. So coming soon where that, that primary structure comes from. But here's an idea that we need to consider with the primary structure of our proteins. Not only is it just the order that those amino acids go in, it's also the level of protein structure that if I mess this up, nothing else is gonna be right, most likely. Most likely, I have to get the order of amino acids correct if I don't get the order of amino acids correct, everything else, all of their folding patterns will probably be wrong or there's a much bigger chance that they'd be wrong. So consider that at the very base, the very bottom of, of a protein, we've got the order that its amino acids are found in and that's called its primary structure. We got to get it right at primary structure level to be able to do some of these other structure levels that we're going to talk about. So we've got 
Ooh, that picture looks terrible. Um, we've got our, our protein, we've got a line of amino acids. Those lines of amino acids, certain sections of them start to hold up on themselves. And when my, my parts of the amino acid chain hold up on itself, that's known as the secondary structure. Secondary structure. So the secondary structure of a protein is when certain sections of that amino acid chain start to kind of attach to each other. So we have two secondary structures. One of them is called an alpha helix. One of them is called a beta sheet or a beta pleated sheet. Your lesson talks about how with the alpha helix, think about it kind of like uh, the kinds of ribbons you can put on a gift for someone. So those curly Q ribbons that, that swirl around and around, an alpha helix shape. Think about a beta pleated sheet kind of like an accordion that folds in on itself. So two levels of, of what we call secondary structure. It's where little areas, small sections of a protein fold in on itself. So my amino acids interact with each other in little small ways. Now notice with my secondary structure here, how I interaction here, it's showing you these yellow lines, show you the way that my amino acids interact with one another. Notice that I'm seeing an oxygen, interact with a hydrogen and an oxygen interact with a hydrogen same thing down here oxygen and a hydrogen when I go over to my beta sheet it's the same deal oxygen and hydrogen always oxygen and hydrogen interacting with each other this is because I have places on these two parts of these amino acids where they're not sharing their electrons equally. So they have partial positive and partial negative charges. Unit one review here. What's the name of partial positive and partial negative charges? What are those things called? Yeah, so those things are called dipoles. They form because of polar bonds, right? Polar covalent bonds. So here's, here's some review for us. Dipoles, partial positive or partial negative, and they form with those polar covalent bonds. In an amino acid, I've got this carboxyl group right here, where this carbon is sharing electrons with oxygen, but oxygen really likes electrons, like a lot. Carbon likes them, but not as much as oxygen does. So oxygen is seeing those electrons more often. Does that mean it's the partial positive or it's the partial negative? If oxygen is seeing those electrons a lot, what's my dipole on this one over here? Yeah, a few of us have, have chimed in in the chat. My partial negative charge is going to be next to the oxygen. By the oxygen, by the O. So I've got a partial negative charge here by the oxygen. Over here, I've got nitrogen interacting with hydrogen. Nitrogen is a lot like oxygen. It really, really likes electrons. It really, really likes them more than hydrogen does, which means that hydrogen is not going to see those electrons as often. Hydrogen is going to have a positive dipole. So I'm going to add that note here. Our positive dipole is by the hydrogen. So we've got a partial positive and a partial negative. And then I look up here, partial positive, partial negative, positive, negative. We can go all through our beta sheet structure, or all through our alpha helix structure, it's always a positive dipole with a negative dipole. And more specifically, it's always oxygen interacting hydrogen. So for my friends who've worked on, on this lesson, which of our kinds of chemical bonds is actually forming here? Which kind of bonds 
do these these yellow lines represent? Does anyone know? Yeah, so a couple of us are chiming in. The yellow lines are hydrogen bonds. The yellow lines here that are holding together my, my two parts of this amino acid chain are hydrogen bonds, meaning my hydrogen's positive dipole is attracted to my oxygen's negative dipole. We do see, a couple of us were mentioning polar bonds. This bond right here, let me get my pencil. We'll do some circling here. This bond right here would be polar covalent. This one would be polar covalent. Again, this one went up one, and this one would be polar covalent. Those, so I'll, I'll type that for us. The orange bonds are polar covalent bonds, but it's actually hydrogen bonds, the attraction between an oxygen and a hydrogen. Those are what's holding together this thing called my secondary structure. So the secondary structure of a, a protein, which are these, these curly Q ribbons, alpha helices, or these beta pleated sheets, that structure is caused by hydrogen bonds. It's caused by oxygens interacting with hydrogens in, in parts of my amino acid chain that are not right next to each other. They're not next door neighbors, these guys are next door neighbors. These are across the way. When they interact, we form beta sheets or we form alpha helices. So hydrogen bonds are the big basis for secondary structure. Jacqueline asked, and that happens if small proteins fold in. Um, so pretty much every protein in your body has this secondary structure but most of them are also gonna have one layer above it too. Um, and so the, let me show you a picture here. This would be considered a small protein in, in your body. And so it's going to have some of those structures we just talked about, the helices and the beta sheets, but it's also going to have uh, what we call tertiary structure, tertiary structure. Pretty much every protein in your body goes one level up from the alpha helices and the beta sheets. So even the smallest proteins probably have one more layer that is that tertiary structure layer. The tertiary structure of a protein is its overall 3D shape. It's overall 3D shape. So that's gonna be a sum of all of its alpha helices and it's beta sheets interacting with each other. Help me out in the chat here. When I look at this protein, this protein has an overall 3D shape here. I see some areas that are alpha helices and some that are beta sheets. What color are alpha helices? Can we tell? What parts of this protein are those alpha helices? Yeah, it's that that orange color, right? That orange beige color. So see my little curly Q ribbons like you put on a, a birthday present here. I've got two sections of this protein that are alpha helices. And my beta sheets then are the parts that I see in what color? What color are those beta sheets? Can you tell? The, the beta sheets are the blue parts that I see kind of on the back side of this protein. So I, I've folded this protein. Uh, imagine that you've got a curly Q ribbon that's, that's laying on the table in front of you. Uh, and then you twist up that ribbon in on itself to build something that's 3D, that's standing up. That's what tertiary structure is. Somebody asked in the chat about the arrows. So you can see there's a little arrow right here. There's a little arrow right here. You see them in particular with these beta sheets. It, it's not showing you their function. Uh, it's showing you the order that the amino acids are, are connected to each other in. So with proteins, how they're made of amino acids, remember that that means that half of it is the amine group and half of it is the acid group. So those arrows would help me to know which end would have the amine group and which end would have the acid group. So if you wanted to go through, if you were in a biochemistry class 
and you wanted to list the order of each of the amino acids that are in this area, we would know that the order you build it in is we start with the amino acid over here and we, we build this direction. So the, the arrow is a little bit outside of the scope uh, of our class, but that's what it means, that I built it from this end or this direction, so you know which, which order it's going in. I'll, I'll mention, just to, to toss it out there, how there are some sections here that are gray, right? These gray sections are places where I only have primary structure. I only have primary structure. Can anyone remind me in the chat, what is the primary structure of proteins? Do we remember? What do we say the primary structure was? Yeah, it's the order, right? So if I only have primary structure, I only have a line of amino acids. There's no alpha helices. There's no beta sheets. We don't see every amino acid in a protein like this. Not all of them curl up into alpha helices. Or not all of them lay flat in a beta sheet. Some of them just kind of exist. So that's, that's what we see out here, is it just kind of exists in a line. These are places where I would only have primary structure. Uh, so I've got a question. Are secondary structures either alpha helices or beta sheets? Um, yes. And then the way that I put those together is the tertiary structure. Here, let me turn on my, my camera briefly because I, I will show you how I would normally show you guys this in, in class. Wait for it to pop up. Okay. So when we're talking about protein structure, primary structure, imagine it's just a line, right? So I've got a line of amino acids, and in that line of amino acids, sometimes we curl up this direction, so make a curly ribbon. That would be my secondary structure of a uh, alpha helix. Beta sheets are when I take that line and I go back and forth, kind of like this. That'd be beta sheets. When we think about 3D structures, imagine those curly cues that are like this, or imagine those beta sheets that were laying out on your desk. You take them all and you kind of twirl them. We twist them together and now I've got 3D that I can hold in my hands. So tertiary structure is going to be a mix of those alpha helices that used to be flat or those beta sheets that used to be flat. I took them all, I twisted them, and I squashed them on themselves. And that gives me my tertiary structure. So tertiary structure does have alpha helices and beta sheets in it. Or we, we will see some proteins that only have one of these. So maybe it has just alpha helices. Uh, or more dangerously, the, the disease you're reading about um, this week actually only has, when we build the bad proteins, it only has beta sheets. So it's possible to, um, to just have one or the other. Tertiary structure, though, for most proteins, probably does include both. Okay, <laughs> yeah, Monica, I saw your hand go up and I was like, I, sure, we can talk. <laughs> okay, so tertiary structure, 3D shape. Like I said, remember, imagine holding it in your hand, tertiary structure. Otherwise, these other shapes would just be lying flat on the desk in front of you. And you would have a ribbon that's lying on the desk in front of you, or you'd have a beta sheet that is, is going back and forth, kind of like a, a flat accordion in front of you. Now, the reason that I make this tertiary structure has to do with a part of the amino acids that we haven't talked about yet. So th the way that I end up squishing it together to look like this instead of just a flat thing on your desk has to do with a part of the amino acids called the functional groups, the functional groups. So the reason it ends up like this has to do with that third part of an amino acid called the functional groups. Let me read my question in the chat. Uh, are hydrogen bonds forming when the amino acids fold enough to bring the dipoles close to each other? Yes. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. So um, if my, I'm going to bounce back here to our secondary structure to see those groups again. If it happens that this carboxyl group is close enough to this amine group over here, this is a positive charge or a partial positive, and this is a partial negative. If they get close enough to each other, 
then yeah, we're absolutely going to form that hydrogen bond. Same thing here. I've got a partial positive and a partial negative. Opposites attract in, in chemistry and in anatomy. So if I get these guys close enough to each other, then they're going to attract and we are going to form that secondary structure. So yeah, it's just because those dipoles are close. Remember we when we had talked about hydrogen bonds, by the way, hydrogen, I cannot spell this morning, so sorry guys, hydrogen bonds, there we go. Remember that I had put them in, in air quotes for you? Um, they, they are bonds, technically. It, it is a way that we interact with each other, but in hydrogen bonds, we don't share electrons. Hydrogen bonds are just based on the fact that you have a positive dipole and I have a negative dipole, so I'm attracted to you. The, these are not like covalent bonds where we actually shared. So these were just about attractions. Partial positive, partial negative, we're close, let's bond. Let's be attracted to each other. So to corollary thought then, these being hydrogen bonds, means they're a lot weaker than the bond that's holding these parts together, right? Covalent bonds, sharing bonds, much stronger. Hydrogen bonds, a lot weaker because they're just based on opposites attracting. And in this case, it's only partial opposites attract to each other as well. Okay, so tertiary structure, that 3D shape that you can hold in your hand, that is based on this part of an amino acid that we named on the other side. Let me name it again for us. It's called the functional groups. The functional groups. So this part right here, there's 20 different varieties of, of what chemical thing could be attached right here. So the functional group is the middle part. It's in between the amine group for the amino part of its name and my acid group for the acid part of its name. Okay, for my friends who worked on this lesson, help out my friends here in the chat who have not yet. Remind me, you do or do not need to memorize the names of the amino acids that are nonpolar. Do we need to memorize this list here? <laughs> yes, we, in, in all caps, someone was saying, we not need to memorize this, yeah. Emphasis for you guys, please. We want to talk about, about study things that, that are a waste of time. Do not memorize these. 100%, I promise you, I am not going to ask you if alanine is nonpolar, polar, positive, negative. I'm not going to ask you that. I will tell you what kind of amino acid it is. Um, I will not make you memorize that. So we do need to know that there are some amino acids that are called nonpolar. We do need to know that there are some amino acids, here I'll show you on my next slide here, that are polar amino acids. And we do need to know there are some amino acids that have a, a side chain or a functional group up here that has a, pot, a negative charge on it or a positive charge on it. We need to know about these functional groups up here that they come in different varieties. And when we talked about those varieties in the lesson, what did I tell you guys to kind of think about the functional group of an amino acid like? What is the functional group like in a person? Does anyone remember what I told you to, to think about it as? Yeah, so, so Christina's right. I want you to kind of think about these functional groups like personality types. So uh, some of us might be considered a more introverted person. So some of us, our personality type, our functional group would be an introvert. Some of us are more extroverted. So our functional group or our personality type would be extrovert. Um, we could do this with anything, right? So some of us love coffee. I say as I stare at my coffee cup on my desk, right? That might be our functional group. Some of us can't stand coffee. That, that would be our functional group. Think about these functional groups like personality types in people. So there's a lot of different personality types in people. There's lots of different personality types in amino acids. They can be positively charged, like I see here. 
They can be negatively charged, like I see here. They could be polar, like I see with all of these amino acids. Or they can be nonpolar, like I see with these amino acids. Each of the amino acids has a personality type. What happens with that, what kind of personality type that is, is going to help us to determine the way I'm going to squeeze my amino acid chain into a 3D shape. So let's do some review here. Um, I'm going to make a, a list at the top. Some of my amino acids are nonpolar. Some of them are polar. Ooh, that's not right. Ignore that. Talking to you about that coffee cup on my desk, right? Have not drank enough. And some of them we're going to call charged. Charged meaning it's positive or it's negative. Nonpolar and polar. These are words that we know from unit number one. When I talk about nonpolar, what, what's going on with that? What does that mean about you if you are nonpolar? What are some of the things we said about nonpolar stuff? I like it. Okay, so uh, equal sharing, equal sharing bond, which means uh, that I am uh, no charge. No charge positive, no charge negative, right? We're equal sharing of the electrons. And because we have no charges, we are hydrophobic, like you guys said. Hydrophobic. We hate water. We can't even with water. Some of my amino acids have nonpolar side chains. Their functional group, their personality type, shares its electrons equally, has no charges, the only emphasis here, our underlying highlight star, is this one right here. They are hydrophobic. They can't even with water. So if it's an amino acid that has these functional groups that we see here, again, not going to ask you to memorize these, so please don't. But if I have a nonpolar functional group attached, you are not going to find me by water. I cannot stand water. That's my, my personality type. I'm nonpolar. Let's do the same thing here with polar. When we talk about something that's polar, what are some of the things we know about that if it's polar? Yeah, so, so we're going to start with our big one, right? It's hydrophilic. Hydrophilic loves water, right? Yeah, it has those dipoles that we just talked about, dipoles, right? So we've got partial positive. Partial plus, partial minus. We've got dipoles, right? So if I'm looking at a polar amino acid, that's going to be one that has partial positives and partial negatives, just like water has partial positives and partial negatives. So when we talk about those personality types that are polar, what you should be thinking is they're hydrophilic. These are personality types, or these are groups that want to be by water. They've got a charge just like water does. They, they want to be by water. When I talk about things that are all the way positive, or things that are all the way negative, not just partial, positive and negative, all the way positive and negative, these things also like water. So when I talk about charged amino acids, these ones are also hydrophilic. They also want to be around our water because they've got, got a charge too. Um, so yeah, Nicole is, is up ahead of me. They, they are involved in ionic bonds, yes. Um, so here's what I want us to think before I, I move on uh, with this tertiary structure stuff. This table that we made up here, that, that talks about, we'll, we'll use our word from unit number one, right? The biochemical properties of, of these different amino acids. If I tell you something is nonpolar, you should know that's something that's hydrophobic. It's something that doesn't like water. If I tell you that I've got an amino acid that's polar, you should know that that one is hydrophilic. It's gonna have dipoles, it likes to be around water. If I tell you that it's a positive amino acid or a negative amino acid, 
Again, that's another one that we know wouldn't mind being around water. So when we talk about these personality types, the big thing to consider is how would they behave with water? Would they hate it? Like if they're a nonpolar amino acid, would they like it if they're polar because it's similar to them, partial positives and negatives? Uh, or again, would they like it because they have a full negative or a full positive? So those personality types or the, the things we got going on with, with our functional groups, that's going to dictate the way that we fold. Let me scroll back up because I know Jacqueline had a question. Yeah, so Jacqueline, I'm going to get to that particular question at the end of class. Are you cool to wait at the end of class? Because we'll work on that table together. Okay, perfect. So I promise we'll, we'll address that together. Okay, so this slide again shows us, let's get our word back up here, tertiary structure, tertiary structure, the 3D shape of a protein. So here's that protein we were looking at before. Remember it had some alpha helices and it had some beta sheets in it. We squeezed them all together to make a 3D shape and that's this protein here. So let's talk about, now that we've, we've established that I've got different personality types, now we're gonna look at, this picture shows me how those personality types can be used to build this 3D shape to make us shapes like this instead of just flat on the table. So the first way that, that my functional groups can help me have a 3D shape is sometimes my functional groups help me to form hydrogen bonds. Remember I put them in little quotes here because we're not actually sharing any electrons. It's just a positive dipole being attracted to a negative dipole. So hydrogen bonds, remember, they always form when hydrogen's got a positive dipole and it's close to somebody with a negative dipole. Hey, not a trick question. Which of those types, which of those personality types of amino acids did we say had dipoles? Which type of amino acids have dipoles? Yeah, so the ones that have dipoles are ones that are polar. So hydrogen bonds are going to form between polar amino acids. I'm going to abbreviate them AA, polar amino acids. They're going to form hydrogen bonds because I have a positive dipole with hydrogen and a negative dipole with oxygen. If I have a full-on positive charge, or a full on negative charge, instead of forming a hydrogen bond, I would actually form an ionic bond. So ionic bonds form, remember back from last unit, when opposites attract to each other. So when a positive is attracted to a negative, I'm gonna form an ionic bond. So all of those amino acids that we said, we called them charged amino acids, charged, amino acids with a, a positive or a negative, those ones contribute to my overall 3D folding pattern that I see here because they'll actually form ionic bonds with each other. So a positive one will be attracted to a negative one and we've got an ionic bond going on right here. Hey, sometimes we build covalent bonds Sometimes we can build a nonpolar covalent bond between a couple of amino acids. These particular amino acids each have a sulfur group in them or have a sulfur uh, atom. And that's the S that I see here is sulfur. So I call this particular kind of bond a disulfide bond. So when one amino acid with a sulfur gets close to another with a sulfur, they might form a disulfide bond. Hey, not a trick question. A disulfide bond is considered a nonpolar covalent bond. Nonpolar covalent bonds. Were those ones strong or weak? Nonpolar covalent 
bonds. Yeah, the, these are strong bonds. Jacqueline's totally right. These are the strongest kind of bonds that we can make. These are equal sharing bonds. Remember, covalent means sharing. Nonpolar means equal. So nonpolar covalent bonds are equal sharing bonds. Sometimes amino acid from over here in my big long protein chain will, will share electrons equally with an amino acid all the way over here. If that happens, we've attached these parts of my protein together really strongly. That's going to really help me hold together my 3D shape. When I form an ionic bond, it's still a bond. It's still opposites attracting to each other. But remind me, ionic bonds, they do or do not dissolve in water. Do ionic bonds dissolve in water? Yeah, these ones do, right? So this, this bond down here, this ionic bond, it, it would be susceptible to the effects of water. This disulfide bond is not. We're equal sharing here, nonpolar covalent. This would not fall apart with water. This one might. If the water gets close enough, it might disrupt this bond. But when we use a disulfide bond or a nonpolar covalent bond to hold things together, we are together for life. We're sharing equally. We're stuck. Hey, one last type of, of thing that holds together tertiary structure. This is called hydrophobic attractions. And again, I put attractions here in, in air quotes because this is not a type of bond. We're not sharing electrons with each other. The way that hydrophobic attractions work is a couple of hydrophobic amino acids are, are grouping with each other. They're attracted, again in quotes, to each other because both of them hate water. <clears throat> now, I, I'm going to use an analogy here, and I apologize in advance if I offend anybody. Um, so I am a Broncos fan. Oh, it's really sad to be a Broncos fan right now. Denver Broncos football. That's the other place I come from is Colorado. I've lived everywhere. Sometime we can have a chat about this. But Denver Broncos, the football, football team of my childhood, I'm rooting for them always. <clears throat> so uh, say they were decent this year, which they're not. But let's pretend they are. They get into the playoffs, and then they get eliminated. We get to the end of the season, and it's the Super Bowl, Right. So I um, can't remember if it was last year or a year ago when in the Super Bowl, everyone's least favorite team, the Patriots. And again, that's, I might offend somebody, so I apologize if I do. But Patriots versus anybody in the Super Bowl, I don't care who the anybody is. I am rooting for anybody but the Patriots. So we've got a bunch of people in the nation that, well, we don't want the Patriots to win. So it doesn't matter if it's the Seahawks. It doesn't matter if it's the Broncos. It doesn't matter if it's the Chiefs. It doesn't matter who it is. We're all rooting against the Patriots. That's kind of the idea of hydrophobic attractions. Maybe we're not the same. Maybe we don't normally root for the same team, but we all root against the same team together. That's how hydrophobic attractions work. We all hate water. So you may not be the same as me, but you hate water too. So I'm attracted to you. We're going to squeeze together and together the two of us are going to make sure there's no water that's close to us. So all of my hydrophobic amino acids like to squeeze together. They like to be close to each other. Hey, what's another name for hydrophobic? Which kind of amino acids did we say were hydrophobic? Yeah, so my nonpolar amino acids, those are the ones that are hydrophobic. Nonpolar and hydrophobic synonyms for each other. So all of those nonpolar amino acids don't like to be by water. They're all squeezing together. They create these little pockets inside the protein where they're gonna, gonna push water out and make sure that water is not there. So here's the big picture. What, what this image is showing me. This image is showing me the ways that I build my 3D shape in a protein, the way that I fold it up on itself. The ways that I fold it up, 
First, I make some places in that protein that don't like water. There are some places that, that squeeze that water out. So maybe I'll group together a couple of proteins, group together their functional groups uh, to squeeze out water. That's these hydrophobic attractions. Some parts of my amino acid chain may have positive dipoles and negative dipoles. So maybe what's holding together these beta sheets over here is hydrogen bonds, where the positive dipole over here is attracted to the negative dipole over here and vice versa. I can use hydrogen bonds to hold together amino acids that are polar. Or maybe I've got some places where I had these amino acids that contained the sulfur group in their functional group. Maybe that's what's holding together these parts right here in my chain, my, my little silver parts here. Or I might have some ionic bonds going on where I've got a fully positive over here and a fully negative over here. The big picture idea is how I get this to fold up this way is I interact different parts of the chain with each other. And the way that I can interact them with each other is based on their functional groups. It's based on the parts that are nonpolar, the parts that have dipoles, the parts that have positives or negatives. That's how I form my 3D shape, by interacting the functional groups with one another. I need to pause for a moment, let you process, and let you type some questions for me in the chat. Go for it, Miriam. So I don't know if this question um, is a smart one or not, but looking at the structure right here, um, I always think that ionic bonds are the strongest because uh, there uh, there is like uh, charges involved. Um, I would imagine that ionic bond, that chain will be very close at this point, closer than any other uh, section where hydrogen bonds or hydrophobic uh, bonds um, is that is that true uh, so compared to hydrogen bonds and uh, compared to hydrophobic attractions we would say that ionic bonds are probably probably stronger than those things uh, they're not as strong as covalent bonds are because in covalent they share in ionic it's just the opposites attracting but an ionic bond would be stronger than a hydrogen bond would be. Um, so, so that is correct that, that ionic bonds are stronger than that. They're just not as strong as, as these ones here. The exact, um, exactly how close these different things would be to each other um, can vary. They, so all of these would actually have to be close enough to each other for the functional groups uh, to interact with one another. So in actuality, probably, um, I, I think that this image, full disclosure, was just kind of made um, to give you an idea of what it looks like. The, the different distances between the amino acids doesn't actually mean anything. So um, just knowing that we can form ionic bonds between different amino acids, whether it's amino acids that are right here, close to each other, whether it's amino acids that are, that are farther away in the chain, um, the distance between them would shrink. It would be probably closer than all these little letters suggest. Um, so it, it has less to do with their, their proximity like this. And think about 3D shape more like this, where they fold together in this way. Does, does that help with your question? And for my friends in the chat, if you're feeling okay, give me a thumbs up. Are we okay on 3D structure? A couple of us are okay. Let me do my daily penguin. Help me remember to, uh, to draw you one. I'll draw you one later if I remember. Okay. Primary structure order that my amino acids are linked together in. Here's my primary structure right here. Secondary structure, when places that are close to each other fold up on each other. So we form these alpha helices like I see here, 
we form these beta sheets that are kind of going back and forth inside this mess here. Tertiary structure, the big picture, the whole thing that folded up on itself. Um, so Jacqueline asked, the personality types only come from tertiary structure. Actually flip that statement backwards, tertiary structure only comes from the personality types. So it, it's, you're linking those things together correctly. It's personality types and tertiary structure. Um, those, the tertiary structure though, this 3D shape comes because of what personality types my amino acids have. So yeah, they're 100% linked to each other. When I look at a sketch here of proteins, uh, I can use their personality types of the amino acids that are inside of them to predict things about their structure. Now, what we're looking at right here is a picture that shows me the phospholipid bilayer. So I've got my little head groups that are red up here. Got my little tails that are blue. And I can see it over here too, tails that are blue, head groups that are red. Let's imagine that we're looking at a picture of the whole cell and not just a little section of it, its membrane. So we're on the cytoplasmic side over here. We're on the extracellular side over here. Who can remind me where in this picture? So let me label some places here. We got number one. We got number two. We got number three. If these are my places, one, two, three, which of those places do I find water in? Where is there water normally? Yeah, so several of us are, are remembering extracellular fluid outside the cell. I've got water. Cytoplasm, technically cytosol, is the fluid that's inside the cell. I have water inside the cell too. So on the cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane and on the extracellular side, outside and inside of this cell, I've got water. This middle part inside here is where I find those lipid tails, right? Hey, those lipid tails were non-polar, which remind me, how do they feel about water if they're non-polar? How do we feel about water if we're non-polar? Yeah, we don't like it, right? We're afraid of it. This part, the middle of the membrane, is hydrophobic. Does not like water because it is non-polar. Hey, remember when we were talking about stuff that can and can't diffuse across the membrane? When we talked about things that can diffuse straight through the membrane, did they match the heads or the tails? If you can diffuse straight through, you match, yep, you match the tails. You match this middle part right here. Hey, check this out. If I am a part of a protein, if I'm amino acids that live with these lipid tails, not only am I passing through, I'm with them all the time. I have to match them. So these, these amino acids that I see that live surrounded by my nonpolar parts of a phospholipid live by those hydrophobic tails. These amino acids that are embedded inside the membrane that are touching these little lipid tails, those are gonna be hydrophobic. And what's, what's the other word for hydrophobic? What word did we say was a synonym for hydrophobic? Yeah, so my blue amino acids are non-polar. I'm gonna put in parentheses, hydrophobic. If you live in the membrane, you got to match the part of the membrane you're inside of, and that part is nonpolar. 
that part is hydrophobic. And remember, that part has no water. That's why it, it can live like that, because there's no water inside of there. Now, these guys up here, what color do we want to call these? Are, are they magenta? Are they purple? I, I didn't quite know how to describe them in your guided lesson. Um, I guess we'll maybe say magenta, right? I don't know. The, uh, the, the purple amino acids, I actually have a color to match them. The purple amino acids uh, are touching water. Let me type that and then I'll stop. Oh, purple, yeah, so it kind of looks purple. Uh, these purple amino acids that I can see throughout here, these ones are touching water. We can, can make that statement because remember there's water out here. Oops, did I go choppy? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the guideline says purple, magenta, whatever it says, who knows. <laughs> um, so we, we said that there's water here in the extracellular fluids. We said there's water here in the cytosol. So all of my magenta purple amino acids, whatever color they are, they are touching water. So what are the words that we would use to describe amino acids that are touching water? What are those personality types that would be okay with touching water? Who could touch water? Yep, my polar ones can touch water. Yeah, polar means they're hydrophilic. What was my other personality type that we said would be okay with water? Yeah, so so Jacqueline mentioned it comes in two eyes, right? My charged amino acids. Yeah, so the ones that basically are, are kind of like ionic, right? So my positive and my negatively charged amino acids, those ones are touching water and, and they're okay with that because they have a charge. My polar ones, they can be touching water because they match water. They're polar like water is. If you don't match water, if you don't like water, you're gonna chill out with the parts of the membrane that also don't like water. So in this picture, and there's a question, you've got a learning objective that asks you about using um, the chemistry of amino acids to predict their location in the membrane. Here's what, what that learning objective is referring to. Am I an amino acid that would live next to those tails? Am I an amino acid that could live on the outside or would live on the inside? It all comes down to the basic chemistry from unit yeah. one. Ooh, somebody's mic might be on. Let me see. I don't know. I'm echoing back and forth. So it, it all comes back to what we talked about. Inside here, we hate water. So inside here, if you hate water, you can chill out with us, nonpolar. Outside here, we got water. You better be able to deal with that. So if you're polar or if you're charged, you can deal with that. So those personality types not only give us our 3D shape. They also help us to know where you live in the membrane. Are you in the very middle? Are you on the outside? Are you on the inside? That, that's what that learning objective refers to. Now there's one more layer of protein structure, and I know that we missed those questions. I'm gonna split us up into groups to do those questions, so bear with me, we skipped them. I had a question in the chat. Is the blue amino acid primary and the purple? Uh, so, so the blue actually, if you if you look at the the shape of it, I think this was us trying to draw alpha helices uh, inside of here. Uh, these might be some beta sheets out here. Uh, ignore the the different structures when we're, when we're talking about the kinds of amino acids that can be in different places. That question actually is going all the way back kind of to the primary structure of the protein. If I'm saying who can live inside of here, who can live there has to do with the sequence that the amino acids are. Uh, if I'm asking you who can live out here, again, that has to do with the sequence of the amino acids that are out there. So when the question asks about which kind of amino acids are found where, it's actually a really good example of how primary structure and tertiary structure come together. 
So remember, primary structure is the order that my amino acids are in. Oops, primary structure order that, that I find them in. Tertiary structure is their 3D shape. So the order that I put my amino acids in with their personality types will dictate the way that I can fold them into a 3D shape. And the order of the amino acids, meaning which ones are there, will also tell me, do you have to be inside the membrane or can you be on one of the outsides of the membrane? So um, this picture kind of gets at how these two kind of structure are related to each other. So it's not necessarily that, that one color shows one type of structure and one shows the other. It just shows that they're, they have different biochemical properties. I'll type that word, biochemical properties. So these guys were nonpolar, these guys polar or charged. That's the, the big idea of, of this picture. One last kind of structure to mention. This last kind of structure is called quaternary. Quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is the highest level of structure that a protein can have. When we talk about a protein that has quaternary structure, it means that more than one amino acid chain is attaching to each other. So we're looking at a picture over here on the left of the protein hemoglobin. We talked about hemoglobin in unit number one. What is the function of hemoglobin? What does hemoglobin do in the body? Does anyone remember? Yeah, so hemoglobin is inside our red blood cells. And the job of hemoglobin inside those red blood cells is to attach to oxygen. So oxygen will actually interact with, you see these little green parts right here? These little green parts are irons. They're, well, there are lots of things, but there's iron in there that oxygen comes and attaches to. And then that red blood cell goes throughout your body and that, that oxygen will actually leave the iron and go away. So this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein that has quaternary structure. What quaternary structure means is multiple amino acid chains are attached. Quaternary structure, more than one amino acid chain that are attached to each other. Now, in the hemoglobin protein, this big shaped hemoglobin protein that we see right here, we actually have four different uh, amino acid chains that attach to each other. So for these four chains, I have two chains that are called alpha chains, and I have two chains that are called beta chains. Hey, I, I want you guys to write this down because it, it confuses my students every semester. This alpha subunit or this alpha protein chain, this is not just alpha helices. We're using alpha, I know it's, it's confusing and stupid that science does this, but this, this alpha subunit right here, it's not an alpha helix. It's a, a protein that has alpha helices and beta sheets that, that fold it on itself. This is something right here that, think about it, is that protein you can hold in your hand, the alpha subunit. The beta subunit doesn't have all beta sheets. It's not just secondary structure. This is a, something, a 3D shaped protein that you can hold in your hand that stands up. So when I build a big hemoglobin protein, when I want the thing that's gonna transport oxygen throughout my body, I put together a, a one protein chain that's called an alpha subunit with another protein chain that's called a beta subunit. I attach these guys to each other and I, I've made one half of hemoglobin. Then I attach another alpha subunit to another beta subunit. I attach these guys together. Now I've got two halves. These two halves have to attach to each other 
to be able to get all the way to my quaternary structure. My quaternary structure is the overall shape of a protein when that protein has more than one amino acid chain. So this one by itself, this blueprint here, that is, is a protein that has tertiary structure. It's got 3D shape. This one right here has 3D shape. All of these are amino acid chains that have shape by themselves. When I put them all together, now I can transport oxygen. What this weird picture is showing you is each of these four chains interacting with each other in the opposite half of hemoglobin. So scientists went through and they looked at all the different amino acids inside hemoglobin in each of these chains. So in particular, we're looking at one of my alpha subunits here. In amino acid number 141, so we're going through the line and we're counting them, number 141, this particular amino acid, scientists figured out, interacts with these two amino acids over here in the other alpha subunit. And this amino acid right here is interacting with this one in my beta subunit. So number 99 in my big long chain in the beta subunit, that's over here interacting with, with these amino acids over here. When I form my quaternary structure, specific amino acids in each of these different chains will attach to each other. So all these little lines to us is all the places that I'm attaching together these four protein chains that I use to build my big overall quaternary structure. My overall shape of this protein when I put more than one amino acid chain together. When I have quaternary structure, if I tell you that it's a protein with quaternary structure, that always means you have more than one amino acid chain, 100% of the time. Quaternary structure means there's more than one amino acid chain connected. Tertiary structure, we're just talking about one. We're talking about one chain that has a 3D shape. Everything below quaternary structure is just one chain. But as soon as we introduce this really high level uh, of protein structure where I put more than one together, now we're talking about quaternary structure. How do we feel about our four levels of protein structure? Give me a thumbs up or give me a question. What questions can I help us understand at this point? Yeah, Hannah says it's going to take some studying. It will, definitely. It, it's learning a, a new set of, of terms, right? So um, learning what the difference is when I talk about something that's primary versus secondary. Yeah, it's just going to take, take lots of, of practice looking at it. Um, Jacqueline asked if it only has to do with hemoglobin. No. Um, these ideas of protein structure apply to all of the proteins in the body. Uh, so all of the proteins in your body have primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Most of the proteins in your body also have quaternary structure, meaning most of the things that actually do jobs in your body are made of more than one amino acid chain that attach to each other. So we used hemoglobin as an example of something that, that has quaternary structure, but pretty much every protein in your body has quaternary structure. Because to do all the stuff that keeps us alive, that, that takes a, a big amino acid chains attached to each other. So this idea applies to any protein, these, these levels of structure. Okay, well, to talk about our last idea, I'm going to ask you a question, a unit one question. When I talk about the shape of a protein, the structure of a protein, am I talking about its anatomy or its physiology? Which of those words meant the shape or the structure of something? Good. Yep, so remember. It is anatomy that I use to talk about the structure of something. 
when I talk about the function of my proteins then, what am I talking about when we're talking function of proteins? Yeah, that's a harder word to type, right? <laughs> Physiology, that's my function. Okay, not a trick question. Anatomy and physiology, are they related to each other or are they not related to each other? Yes or no? Related or not related? Yes, they are. I'm glad we, we all agree that they are. Anatomy and physiology related to each other. I got to have one for the other to, to happen. The structure has to be right for the function to be able to occur. When we talk about proteins, they need to have their normal shape to be able, oh, Hannah says I cut out, sorry. When we talk about proteins, they need to have their normal shape to be able to do their job. When I talk about a protein that is denatured, a protein that is denatured, here's an underlined highlight star definition for denatured. It's the protein that has permanently lost its 3D shape. Permanently lost its 3D shape. Denatured proteins no longer have the shape they're supposed to have. Not a trick question. If I have permanently lost my shape, what would that mean about my function? Do you think denatured proteins can do their job in a cell? Would denatured proteins still do their job? Yeah, absolutely right. They're not going to be able to do their job. Denatured proteins no longer have their 3D structure, which means they can no longer do their job. There's no way, it's, just, it's over for them. So the best way, the best analogy I can give you for what you see denatured proteins when you see that is when you cook an egg. So when you cook an egg, it goes from having a very clear, um, we call it the whites, right? So the clear white part of the egg to it becoming a white part. The way that we go from you can't see it to you can see it is we permanently change the shape of those proteins. Because we permanently change their shape, they go from being clear to being opaque. We change the, the way that they interact with light. For my friends who, who've worked on our lesson outline, I gave us an idea of several different things that can be used to denature proteins. Can you help me out in the chat? What are some of those things that I can use to permanently get rid of the shape of a protein? Yeah, we, we've already talked about one of them, right, with our, our eggs example. So if we have uh, too much heat, too much heat, that's one way I, I can change my proteins. If you heat up proteins really hot, they can't hold themselves together anymore. So my protein can become denatured if it gets too hot. Uh, we have a mention in the chat about pH. Uh, so pH is how acidic or basic it is. So if we have something like stomach acid, for example, you bump a protein into that, it will 100% lose its shape. That's how you consume proteins, is we, we use acid to, uh, to break them apart. But if for some reason it gets too basic too, if there's, there's too much, um, if your, your bloodstream is too basic, that can give your proteins some problems too. So if it's acidic or if it's basic, outside of the normal ranges, that will denature a protein. Uh, we, yeah, we also have chemicals. Um, chemicals can denature a protein. And then the, the last thing that was mentioned in, in your notes outline, which applies to the application activity this week, is when we touch other denatured proteins. When we touch other denatured proteins, when we bump into them, that can cause a normal protein to change its shape. And this is a really scary kind of disease that we can have in the body um, when we get some proteins that are denatured and they start going and denaturing other proteins in our body. So we're looking at, in this week's uh, 
learning activity, we're looking at something called Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease. I'm just going to abbreviate it as CJD because I'm not going to type that big long name. <laughs> You'll see it in your guided lesson and your activity. Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease, CJD. Here's how the process works. Over here on the left, you see a normal protein that we have inside our neurons. So this is my normal protein. Not a trick question here. When I look at my normal protein, what's the name of the type of secondary structure that you can see in this protein? What are these things called? These little curly cues here. What do I call those guys? Yeah, so, so these little curly cues that we see right here, those are the alpha helices. So normal protein living in your neurons, in, in your brain cells, doing just fine, looks like this. Here's its, its normal D shape. This is what we call our prion protein. I'll type that word and you'll see it. Prion protein. Hey, not a trick question. Is the 3D shape of the prion protein the same or different from the normal protein? Are these the same or different? Yeah, a couple of us, uh, a couple of us agree they're different. I promise it's not a trick question, right? Uh, it, it, I, I ask tricky questions sometimes, but that wasn't one of them. This is very different. Than, than this is over here. When we compare my prion protein to my normal protein, the prion protein has a ton more beta sheets. We went from having a bunch of alpha helices, these little curly Q ribbons, to having the beta sheets that I see here, the flat parts. So the way I go from curly Q ribbons, alpha helices, to beta sheets in this disease is this kind of protein, this prion over here, bumps into this normal protein. So we got a little flow chart going on. So my normal protein is right here, shown with a blue circle. This blue circle protein, normal, bumps into not normal. Here's not normal. They bump into each other. And not normal says to the normal protein, hey, I've got a really awesome shape check me out, beta, helis, beta sheets are all the rage right now. And my, my poor normal protein says, sure, they do look pretty awesome, changes its shape. Now, both of my proteins, I used to have one that was folded wrong and one that was folded right. Now both of them are folded wrong and now both of them are gonna float around in the neuron, go find other normal cells and say, hey, I promise you really wanna have beta sheets like me. And that protein, young and impressionable, is going to change its shape too. So we do this long enough where misshaped proteins bump into regular shaped proteins that will end up with a whole bunch of proteins inside our cell that don't do their job anymore because they're the wrong shape. So when I have all these wrong shaped proteins, what ultimately ends up happening is they'll kill the cells. So they'll kill the brain cells. When you're reading about Creutzfeldt Jakob's disease, um, they, they talk about how when you look at the brain tissue of someone who has this disease, it literally has holes in it because enough cells have died that there leaves spaces inside the brain uh, because all of these misfolded proteins killed so many cells. So we need our proteins to have the right shape to do their job. If we fold them wrong and we keep doing it over and over and over again, we're going to end up killing our cells. And especially if we're talking about brain cells, that is bad news. So um, there's a crash course for you in why prion proteins, misfolded proteins, why they're bad. Prion proteins, that's going to be an issue either if, it, if it's a protein by itself, it could be a tertiary structure issue, or if we start grouping these proteins together, it could be an issue with quaternary structure as well. What questions? So I'll show you in just a moment here. I'm going to split us up, up into groups to, to work on these questions as a heads up. This is where we're going. So besides these kinds of questions, I 
want to ask if we have any other questions for today's class. Yeah, Jacqueline, you got a question? You want to say it or you want to type it? Here, I'll draw you guys the penguin. Ah, Jacqueline had typed it already. Either that or she's a whiz at typing. It says in the notes that the plasma membrane and the cytoskeleton both allow receiving messages. Um, the cytoskeleton is, is not about messages. Um, what does the cytoskeleton help a cell to do? What's the function of the cytoskeleton? Let me put that question to the class. Yeah, the cytoskeleton is all about shape. So giving a cell its structure or giving it its shape, um, that's the function of the cytoskeleton. We have, have proteins that, that live in the plasma membrane that receive messages. Those proteins are different from the cytoskeleton proteins. Sometimes they're attached to the cytoskeleton, um, but those, those receiver proteins, the ones that are listening for messages, they're different from the cytoskeleton one. What other questions do we have? Any other questions? Yep, Christina, go for it. Question about denatured proteins. Today's penguin has hair bows. We did a hat a couple days ago. Today we got hair bows. Is there ever a chance that denatured proteins go away? They always cause a problem. Uh, yeah, so short answer is yes. Um, your cell is, is monitoring its proteins. It's checking its proteins. If a protein gets denatured, um, we usually break it apart. We don't want it floating around causing problems in the cell. Um, does anyone happen to remember? We actually have an organelle that its job is to break down proteins. Does anyone remember who that was? Who's my recycling service in the cell? Yes, those lysosomes. Yep, um, so lysosomes, one of their big jobs is to go through and eat any proteins that accidentally get denatured, but it can be problematic if we've got a denatured protein that's really good at, at bumping into and changing other proteins into being denatured too. Uh, when it gets out of hand, where there's too many of those denatured proteins, the lysosome just can't keep up. So uh, it's not always a problem. But if it, there, there are certain proteins that are particularly, um, I mean, the word that comes to mind is like pernicious. They're just really bad about doing this really fast and really well. Um, and that's what's going on with, with creutzfeldt jakobs disease, which is the human version of mad cow disease for, for my friends who haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Perfect. Okay, well, let me mention this before I, I split us up into groups really fast and to, to end our, our time today. Um, you have two assignments due on Sunday. You have the assignment that's based on lesson number five, the stuff we talked about today. And then you have another assignment that's based on Kreuzfeld Jakob's disease. Um, so make sure to remember that there's two assignments. You're going to watch a short video about a person who had Kreuzfeld Jakob's disease, and then you're going to read some information and watch a video with information in it about that disease to help you do that second activity. So plan to leave yourself plenty of time to work on those two learning activities. Both of them are due Sunday night. So I'm going to turn off the recording. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out via email and we will move on to lesson number six next week.